All right. Uh, well, everybody, thanks for coming in. Um, my name is Mark Borshti. I'm the CTO of Tremo Security, and we are going to be talking about uh, a really short title talk, um, securing uh, multi-cluster management with Argo CD without using static tokens. Um, we got a lot to cover, so let's dive into it. So if you're using multi-cluster today with Argo City, chances are it looks a little something like this. You're in probably one of the hyperscalers, uh, and it all works really well, right? Um, all three of the major clouds have their own sense of identity. They have a way of propagating that identity into your workloads, in this case, Argo CD. And then they have a way of making it so that that identity can be used to talk to other services, other Kubernetes clusters. Uh, this all works out of the box today. Like, there's not really anything special you need to do with Argo CD. Everything gets done in your cloud. Uh, and as long as you're in one of these clouds and you're talking to clusters in one of these clouds, like, that's it. That, that, that's the end of the talk. Um, except there are more than three clouds, right? And that might get me thrown out of the showcase later. Uh, but, you know, you've got more than just those three clouds. We all have complex IT environments. It doesn't just involve maybe our AWS or Google or Azure accounts. It could involve smaller uh, clouds that we might be using for specialty items. It could involve on-prem clouds that we use to manage uh, resources. We might want to go cross-cloud. Uh, so this is where the, the crux of this talk comes in, where we're talking about how do we manage an Argo identity across these different trust boundaries, across these different areas, because the thing is, is that you've got different senses of identity for all these different things. You know, AWS has its own way of doing identity, same with Azure, same with Google. It's not that any one is better or worse than the others, it's different different processes, and that's okay. Uh, your on-prem clusters, depending on how you're deploying it, uh, you know, everything from just deploying kubeadm to you're using an on-prem vendor, they're gonna have their own sense of identity or they might not have any sense of identity at all outside the cluster. And finally, we've got that little uh, orange V on there for V clusters. Uh, anybody who's working with multi-tenancy, uh, might have heard of this concept of running a virtual cluster in which now you've got this virtual cluster that has to piggyback off of the parent's identity. Uh, so how does Argo CD securely interact with all these systems? This isn't a unique problem for Argo CD or uh, to Argo CD. Uh, this has been something that um, Anybody who's tried to run a pipeline external to a cluster has had to deal with over the years. Uh, but Argo's got some really interesting ways to handle it, and that's really where we're gonna have a lot of fun. So how do we securely access something across boundaries? Well, for the most part, you're gonna use a token of some kind. Uh, the reason why I'm not saying certificates here is that usually you're not just crossing a trust boundary, you're usually crossing a network boundary too, which means that your certificate authentication no longer works. You need something to bridge into, which ends up being a header or a token anyway. So we're gonna stick with talking about tokens. And there are really three things that are important about every token. One, they have to be short lived. That scalability you get out of tokens by being able to cross lots of different network boundaries ultimately means that your token is now a risk. Every bearer token, it's called a bearer token because uh, the person who holds it has all the power. Every bearer token is a potential leak. It's a potential vector to get into your systems. And anything that touches that token can be the problem. I'm not just talking about your code. Uh, back in the day, uh, I wanna say it was, maybe it was Calico had a, a bug in it where it was leaking tokens into logs. Um, you know, it's so easy to lose these tokens. So the best way to mitigate that risk is to have really short-lived tokens. And I'm not talking like a day or an hour, I'm talking like a minute. You know, you want that token to be so short-lived that by the time an attacker gets their hands on it, it's utterly useless. It needs to be verifiable. You wanna be able to take that token and say, I can verify that this token is what it was created by who I think it was. Um, in, the, in the use of JOTs, JWTs, JSON Web Tokens, that usually cryptographic, right? Somebody publishes their public key, you get it, 
you verify it, all is good. Uh, you also want to make sure it's unique. You want to make sure that the person who used that token, the workload that used that token, you can identify which workload that is because at some point you're going to lose a token and you're going to want to be able to say this is where that token came from. So if you're using the same token for lots of different things, uh, that becomes difficult to do. So before we get into the right way to do this, let's talk about some anti-patterns. Now, uh, I will tell you I am the co-author of Kubernetes and Enterprise Guide. We have 45 pages specifically on this point, so I can't get too deep into all of these. Um, but what I will say is that uh, at the end of the deck, which is attached to um, the schedule entry, uh, there's a bibliography of support for everything I'm about to say why these are all anti-patterns. Uh, so static keys, and when I say static keys, I mean your cloud static keys. I can go into the AWS console, generate a user, get a credential off of it, and use that to access my remote cluster. Uh, problem is, it's not short-lived unless I build a process to constantly refresh it, at which point I've now reinvented OpenID Connect, so what's the point of that? Um, so that's definitely an anti-pattern. The next one, service account token. So if you've ever used the Argo CD CLI to add a cluster into your uh, Argo CD instance, you're, you're using a static service account token. It works with every cloud. It works on-prem. It's long-lived. It doesn't have an expiration date. Um, and it was never designed to be used from outside the cluster. Service accounts were designed to identify workloads. They were never meant to be used from outside of the cluster. So now you're in a similar situation with static keys. It's just you're using a Kubernetes static key instead of your cloud static key. So you have all those same problems. Uh, certificates are an anti-pattern for this because certificates are not long-lived. Uh, granted, you do have a uh, much better security threshold if you set them up properly. The problem is 99 out of 100 times, if you audit a way that certificates are set up, they are not set up properly. So you still need to have secure access into the cluster to be able to generate the certificate and to get it signed. Uh, and half the clouds don't even support it anyway. I know AWS doesn't support it. I don't remember off the top of my head if uh, Azure does. I'm pretty sure Google does. Um, but the point is, is that certificates are still an anti-pattern. They're long-lived, you can't revoke them. There's a constant uh, audit finding on the Kubernetes uh, project that there is no certificate revocation testing. So once you've minted a certificate, that's it. Uh, and then, um, so th these are all your anti-patterns. These are all the ways that you don't want to do it. So let's talk about the way you do want to do it. So let's come back to uh, the slide here. Um, Argo CD, you're typically running on Kubernetes. You have an identity. Kubernetes is giving Argo CD as it gives every pod an identity. Uh, and it meets all of our qualifications, short-lived, especially since 1.24, um, when uh, uh, projected tokens became the standard. Um, it can be anywhere from 24 hours to 10 minutes. But the nice thing is, is that it's also unique. I'm gonna skip over here. It's unique because it's tied directly to your pod. So if that pod goes away, even if the JOT has not expired yet, if you do a token review request, it's going, the API server is going to deny it. So it's, it's unique to a pod and it's verifiable. You can either verify it via standard JWT cryptography um, or you can submit a token review request. So uh, this is what we want to use. Here's the problem, the right side, the Kubernetes cluster. That identity is designed to be used only by the API server or the cluster we're in. Now, we can use token projection to say, hey, let's issue an identity for other clusters. You could totally make that work. The issue is, though, is that you have to hard code that into your deployment, unless you're writing some code to do it. Um, and then the other issue is, that um, you need to have your Kubernetes clusters be able to trust it. So that's, uh, that one's a little tougher to do. So let's have some fun and make it work. So uh, I'm the author of um, Open Unison. Uh, quick show of hands, anybody ever used or heard of Open Unison? 
No? No? Okay. Um, so Open Unison's identity provider uh, makes it really easy to log in to your Kubernetes clusters. So when people do talk about Open Unison, they see it, it's often in respect to logging into things as a user. We're going to use it as a different perspective here as a security token service. So in this instance, Open Unison has trusts with our different clusters. So uh, Argo CD is about to do something with a cluster. First thing it does, it says to Open Unison, hey, with my identity, go ahead and uh, give me a token for this remote cluster. Open Unison validates the identity, goes to step two, does a token review request. So that's our verifiable side. Make sure that the pod is still active. Once that token is verified, Open Unison generates a new token. It's only good for one minute. Argo CD takes that token, needs to send it downstream. Now, here's the next question is, how do we get a downstream cluster to trust it? Most clusters can only trust one identity provider. And you're probably already using that to log in to, with your users. Uh, so Kubo IDC proxy, it was originally written by the folks at Jet, the same folks that gave us Cert Manager, uh, was a way to handle this scenario where a impersonating proxy would allow you to authenticate one way and then use impersonation hairs down to the API server. Um, Jet abandoned it in 2020. We picked it up and moved it forward in 2020 and continued maintenance, adding features, et cetera. Uh, and so in this instance, it makes it real easy for us because we can issue a, a token that Kubo IDC proxy will trust, validate a cryptography using uh, public key cryptography, and then forward the request down to the API server. Uh, starting with 1.31 in beta, Kubernetes now supports structured authentication, which allows you to authenticate multiple JWTs, so you don't have to have just one provider. So it's all the same steps, except we can take out the Kubo IDC proxy, uh, which is really nice. So we talked a lot about how we make all these things happen, but how do we actually tell Argo CD to make these things happen? Well, you got to customize it. The really great thing is that the tools that you use for Argo CD customization of generating different types of manifests are the same way we're going to get it to be able to talk to these different systems. Argo CD is written in Go, uh, which means it uses the client Go SDK. The client Go SDK supports uh, client credential plugins. So if you've ever used, you know, Kube control with AWS or EKS or GCP, you know, you're, you're not getting an OIDC token, you're getting a IAM or whatever token from your cloud. If you look at your Kube control configuration, you'll see a bunch of exec stuff in there for a plugin. That's what this is. So we're gonna use that. Now this client credential plugin just has to generate a token. Um, and it doesn't care what programming language it's in. So here we're just gonna use bash, makes life easy. Uh, production environment, I'd probably turn this into uh, something a little cleaner and go. Um, but like I said, Bash works great for this. Um, we need a way to be able to communicate with Open Unison to pull that token in. Uh, the Argo CD container doesn't include curl. So what we did was we added a uh, empty volume mount. We installed curl into it. So that way we have access to it. And finally, we need a destination. Uh, so this is where application sets come in. We generate a secret for each of our clusters. That secret will have our client credential information in it, but there won't be anything secret in the secrets because everything is generated on the fly. So what was originally designed to store sensitive information about the downstream cluster, like an API server token or whatnot, uh, will instead hold just generic configuration information. So let's look at our demo environment. We've got four clusters. We've got a control plane over here on the left. We have an AWS cluster, an EKS cluster. That's also hosting a V cluster. So that's two clusters we're gonna be working with. Both of those clusters are running Kubo IDC proxy. We also have a on-prem cluster running 1.31 uh, with the structured configuration. So we don't need a Kubo IDC proxy for that to work. And then our control plane has Argo CD with Open Unison tying everything together. So let's go ahead and hope that my prayers to the demo gods were answered. 
and my sacrifices were accepted. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to log in. How am I doing on time? 10 minutes. Beautiful. Uh, so let's go into each one. So first we're going to go into the AWS satellite. And we're going to look at namespaces. Now I'm going to make this a little bigger so you can see there's no my app namespace. We're going to generate that namespace with a... Uh, uh, from Argo CD using our Git repo. So I'm going to do the same thing. This is our uh, V cluster. So same thing. I'll go down here to namespaces. All right? No my app. And then finally, we'll go to our on-prem satellite. And uh, it, you notice that there are no logins. That's because everything has been locked down already with SSO. So no need to re-enter my password. So no my app. All right, so let's go over to Argo CD. No applications, right? So let's go ahead and generate our applications. So there are two po components to this. The first is an application set. How does that look? Can folks see that? Can make that a little bigger? Um, so the application set itself uh, is the template. And there's not a lot of going on here. I've got a Git repo. That's not really the fun part. Um, we are keying off of any cluster secret with this annotation of tremolo.io slash event argocon na. Uh, so when we create this, that's going to tell the set controller to look at all the secrets with that uh, particular annotation. And let's look at those secrets. So this is where the magic is happening. So this is the V cluster one. Now, generally, this is where you would store secret information, right? Passwords, tokens, private keys, whatever. We don't need that because everything's being deriv derived off of ephemeral identities. So here, we're just going to call this script that we've mounted into our Argo CD instance and say, I need to call this open unison. I need this cluster. And here's the identity that I'm going to use. And then everything just happens automatically. So uh, without further ado, I gotta, well, first I gotta log in. Okay, will you log in? Argo Con. All right, I am logged in. I'm in my control plane. All right, so. Uh, a lot's going to happen very quickly. So I'm going to go ahead and create this. I'm going to come back here. We can see it's already created all three of our applications based on the application set. And everything's already synced, right? Like there's not a whole heck of a lot to sync here. But the point is, is it's now talking to all three clusters using ephemeral identities with no static secrets. And just to show you, there's nothing up my sleeves. So this, now we have my app with a uh, config map. So this is the uh, on-prem. Right, and uh, config maps, right? That's there. And we can go through all three and they're all there. So we can see that they're syncing in. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the entire demo. Uh, a lot happened, so uh, if... Uh, uh, happy to answer questions if I can find my uh, thing here. Um, no, I don't. Wrong button. I know how to write software. I don't know how to use it. Um, so thank you. Uh, there is a bibliography at the end with references to everything. This is where you can find me on the socials. Um, the uh, QR code, if you want to leave some feedback, uh, please do. That will bring you back to Shed where you can... Give me a, uh, hopefully a good review. Um, and if you're interested, my book is Kubernetes and Enterprise Guide, third edition. I'll be doing uh, book signings uh, tomorrow in Loft's booth, I think at 12. Um, any questions? Oh, got a question here. Thank you. Um, the question I had, was uh, what other uh, either SSO or identity providers have you experimented with? For example, um, 
could something similar be achieved with the OIDC um, endpoint on uh, an EKS cluster that is provided by AWS. So we're still in the realm of using JWTs and public key cryptography. Um, is there anything else that you can share in that space? Uh, that's a great question. So the question is, could this be done using maybe some of the cloud native OIDC endpoints? Um, you probably wouldn't have to, to be honest, because if you're, you know, you, so the short answer is yes. Like you could do the same thing where you could issue a token that the OIDC endpoint um, is going to recognize, but then you still have to do a token exchange from that OIDC endpoint into your cloud IAM because the clouds themselves don't use OIDC internally. They've got their own identity. So the short answer is yes. The long answer is yes, but it would probably actually end up being more work that way. Thank you. Any other questions? Still got time, so if you have questions. Unless I explained it very, very well. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you very right. much.